think you've got her. I think you've got her. All right, there we go. Okay. That's great. Okay. So since Lisa didn't tell the story, I'll tell it. I actually thought you were going to tell this, Lisa. That's all right. I'll tell you all the story of how we met because it's, kind of, it's pretty fun. I think we told, I told this last time, but that was four years ago, so maybe we've got new people in the room. So Lisa and I met in a really, really fun way. It was during Duck Dynasty, and um, we got invited to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And we were so excited, Willie and I, you know, all dressed up. We actually, um, the problem was uh, I had to ship in his, his tux. And it got there and his pants didn't fit. So he wore jeans to the White House Correspondents Center and refused to wear a tie. He had on like jeans, a tugs jacket that he couldn't button. And um, so that was a fail on my part, but it was a really incredible night. So we walk out of our hotel and we get in the car and Lisa and Tim are in the limo and we jump in with them and we meet them and they tell us they're Robertsons and we're like, we're Robertsons, that's amazing, this is so fun. And on the way there, I actually was talking to mom on the, on the phone and I said, you know, we're going to get to meet the president. We're going to the White House Correspondence Center. And Willie goes, Corey, we're not going to meet the president. Like, there's 3,000 people at this thing. It's not like that. You know, we're going to sit at a table with 3,000 people. And, you know, but I said, okay, well, I guess we're not meeting the president. But it's still going to be a really special night, you know. And so Lisa and I are all dressed up. And we get out. And we walk in and do the red carpet. And it was so amazing. And this Secret Service guy comes up to us. And he says, um, Mrs. Robertson, um, the president would like, would like to meet you. And we were like, okay. So I look at Willie. I want to say, I'm Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did get taken away. So I looked at Willie and was like, see, I told you we were going to meet the president. So they did take us back to the secret room, and President Obama and Ms. Obama were back there. And, and they told us that they watched our show on Air Force One. It was just really incredible, really, really special night. But um, even more special than that was that I got to meet Lisa, and we have maintained a friendship ever since. That was about 10 years ago, and we've been friends, and she's been a friend to me, and um, just a little bit ahead of me in the grandparenting journey. She has nine, I think, is that right? 15? 15, yes. oh my gosh. Yes. I actually, I was trying to do the math, and I counted up between Lisa, myself, and my mom. We are like parenting, grandparenting, great grandparenting, 54 human beings. <laughs> yes. Oh, we have yeah. a lot that are like in our, in our charge. Yes. Yeah. So we feel like we're on vacation being here tonight because <laughs> most of them actually live in our neighborhood. And so there's a constant, um, um, mom, could you keep, you know, honey, because I have to do this. And um, if I say no, then they call to mama. She says yeah. she's like second string, but she's really not. She's first string. And um, so, yeah, we have a lot, of, a lot of little kids and a lot of grandkids, and we absolutely love it. We would not have it any other way. So we're so thankful, so thankful to um, be here tonight and to not have any grandkids on our hip, I guess. <laughs> We love those grandbabies, though, and I do say grandparents are the greatest second string team in the world. Don't you agree? Yes. Because when the first string has anything going on, we are called in the game, right. and we're ready because we've done it before. So we know everything to do, maybe better than the first string. <laughs> we love that, and it's so fun for me now to have uh, Corey be a grandmother, too, so she understands my craziness for the last 25 years yeah. with my grandbabies. And so just this weekend, we had a one-year-old and a two-year-old that we were shuffling, you know, between things that we like we have a life too so we're like can do you have them can I have them do you get them well Corey draws the line at taking them to their IRS swimming lessons yes. has anybody done that it's terrifying it's pain it's painful it's, to watch. it's terrifying so Corey being the new grandmother is not as seasoned as I am and not as tough yet so I get to take them to the traumatic Swimming lessons where they're thrown in the water and flipped upside down and all that. Oh, of course, I gotta say something. Let me say this. So, like, it was okay for my kids to cry, but it's yeah. not okay for my grandbabies to cry. So, I did yeah. go one time, and they both don't want to go in the water with a yes. woman that they don't know. And so, they're crying, and I'm like, I can't do it. Don't. And then, you know, at church on Sunday, when they try to go to class, I'm like, you could just sit with me, you know. But yeah. as a mom, I dropped them off. So, I, I yes. did my duty. Yes. Then. 
So when I say terrifying, I didn't mean for the kids. I meant for the adults that they're <laughs> with, with them. So after I dropped them off, of course, we were flying out. So after we went to swim, then I did the drop off with the other grandma who lives about a 30 minutes from us. So I get in the car and I text Corey, drop off complete like we're in a spy movie or something, you know. <laughs> so we do spend a lot of our time uh, taking care of kids figuring out who can get them and who can't get them and all that sort of thing. And we love it so much. We would not we would not have it any other way. And I will say to you, if you're a mom out there and you're suffering from mom guilt, that's a real thing. Like you can't be in everything and you want to be. And I'm just here to tell you it doesn't get better. Grandmas have that too. I have a 20-year-old who still talks to me about missing her first grade grandparent day when she was in first grade. And she's 20 now. So the, the guilt just carries you on, but that's okay. That helps us to be better, better people. And while we love our babies, we are so super happy. And this is like a great Mother's Day thing that Corey and I get to do together. And we love that because we are so busy. And a lot of times we don't get, even for Mother's Day this year, she'll be speaking someplace else. So we don't get to be together. So what a treat for us. To be here and what a treat for us to see you and I love that we can all actually still get dressed up you know because it's been a couple of years so we even actually had to kind of think that through wait we have to put on shoes that are you know <laughs> that like probably have a heel on them you know those sort of things so anyway we're delighted to be here and I want to start off by saying this this last uh, season um, I've been doing a Bible study with um, some of the ladies at our church and we've been doing Christy McClellan's Jesus and Women. Have you studied that? Okay. Love it. I love it so much. I'm like obsessed with it. And, and so when we started thinking about what we we're going to say here, I told Kim, Corey, one of the things I love about her, she's a biblical culturalist, which is fascinating just to say those words. And so she looks at everything through a Middle Eastern lens. And so when she studies the Bible, she was teaching all of us that in the Middle East, when they study the Bible, they look at it in a different way. For us Americans, like I might be doing a Bible study with you all, and I'll read a scripture, and I say, think about how does that apply to you? How can we put that in our life? But Christy said in the Middle Eastern culture, they say this, what does that teach me about God? And I'm like, oh, my word, how have we missed that? so long. It's just so amazing. So I'm sharing that with Corey and Corey said, mom, I've got notes in my phone where I wanted to do a book about what being a parent teaches us about God. And I said, that's awesome. That's exactly what we can talk about because there's nothing that gets you closer to the spirit of God than having a baby and a teenager and then even an adult child. So we went through our brains and tried to narrow it down because we quickly could have written the entire book, but we've got two apiece to share with you. So that's that's what we're going to do today. Um, are you next? No, go ahead. We have only one mic, <laughs> <laughs> and, and both of us are like, um, okay, talkers. you are, yes. Both and of us are talkers, so yeah, oh. we're like, okay, yeah. how are we going to do this? How, we but, might but, end but, up like this <laughs> by the time it's over tonight, yes. Um, yeah, so as we were thinking about it, I do, I have a note in my phone because, you know, as a mom, there's so many things that, in the good things and the beautiful things about being a mom and the hard things about being a mom that you could say, oh, I can see how God, you know, how you can relate to God in a way as God is our parent. And I just love that, you know, God is referred to as our father. He's our father. He's not this creator in the sky that just like, you know, invented humans and then went, moved on to his next invention. You know, he's, he's our father, and he's a loving father, and he's a father that's active and present in our lives. And, you know, as we think about, as we talk about, because we have Mother's Day coming up, and we talk about parent and the fatherhood, you know, there's, if whatever your earthly father or your earthly mother, there's probably things that you think about when you think about a father and a mother, and some of those are good, and some of those are not so good. I'm sure I've put some of those good things into my children, and some of those not so good things into my children as well. But, um, you know, God is a, is a perfect father, so it's, it's different. So we're an imperfect image of that, so we're not going to pretend that we, like, have it all figured out and we've got it all perfectly. We're, gonna, we're, we're like God with our children, you know, we're not that. But I think there are things that we learn as we see the heart of God as our father that we can see with, with, within motherhood. 
One of the things that we have in our backyard is something that makes you be the most attentive parent ever, and that's a swimming pool. And we've already talked about those swim lessons. There's nothing that will grip you like watching a kid around a pool or a whole bunch of kids around a pool as we've done with our pool over the years. And so one thing that I have thought about as I've watched those kids out there is how God sees us, how we see our children, how we watch our children all the time. The one-year-old and the two-year-old and the three-year-old, all five of them are under three. And so everybody watches all the time. And we've kind of had a rule in our family because we are a big family. We all do live in the same neighborhood, and it's kind of crazy, yes. But we've always had this rule, like if you pass a kid off, you make sure that person knows that you have been handed that child because we have to watch our children all the time. Nothing is like the pool full of kids as they get older, and then they start yelling, watch me, Jim Mama, watch me, watch me. Everybody wants you to see what they're doing. And then as, the ch as kids get older than that, they don't want you to see, you know? <laughs> and that's when you've got that superpower. You have eyes in the back of your head because you're watching and they don't know you're watching because we have to watch them all the time. That's part of our job. So that helps me understand how God watches me. And I think about a story in the Bible that I love so much. It's the story of Hagar. And if you haven't read about Hagar in a long time, get your Bibles out and go back and look at it. Hagar is the story of she's the maidservant of Sarah. Sarah couldn't have a baby, so uh, Sarah decided that Hagar would have the baby for her. Sounded like a good idea to somebody at some point. But then Hagar got pregnant, and then Sarah was not so happy about the thought that she thought was such a good idea. And then she started treating Hag Hagar in such a terrible way that Hagar decided that she needed to run away. And I don't blame her. It was a horrible situation. So she ran away, but then God sent an angel to her. And the angel didn't say to her, you're doing the right thing. Get out of that situation. Go find a new life. You, you're okay. You do you. Let Sarah do her. She didn't say that. The angel didn't say that. The angel said, you go back where you came from because God has a plan for your life. Now, the cool thing about this is Hagar became the only person in the Bible who gave God a name. And she named God Elroy. That was a little hard for me to figure out. You know, I had to do that thing on my phone where how do you pronounce this? And then what I figured out is just Elroy, like the Jetsons. Is anybody old enough to remember <laughs> Elroy? <laughs> Thank you, some older people in the room. So she named him Elroy, but his last name isn't Jetson. She named him Elroy because that means God sees me. So the whole cool thing about this whole story, she had to go right back into that horrible situation, but she felt okay about it because somebody was watching her, not just watching her. Somebody was there making a plan for her life because he was intently watching her. We don't watch our children just because it's like, okay, we're just going to sit here and watch you. No, we're watching because we're either uh, trying to protect them or we're cheering them on or we're guiding them in something. We have a purpose for that watching. And God has a purpose for watching all of us too. He, when I was growing up, this is another old person thing. There was the worst song in hymn history called The All-Seeing Eye Watches You. And it just it was like, what? You know, and so you you, you, you you grew up with this idea that God's got this big eyeball and he's like following you to everything, watching you. But they didn't give you the whole backstory of why he's watching us. Because he loves us so much that he wants to just be there for us, to protect us and take care of us. So one of the things that I've learned so much about God's goodness and his, um, what his character, his traits, are how much he loves me so much that he just watches me all the time. He's always there for me. So then another thing we thought about that, um, that I think we've learned, I've learned from being a parent, is that God created us each as individuals. If you hear, like sometimes you'll hear a man say, like, oh, all babies look alike. 
If you're a mom and you've had a baby, you know that is not true. Your baby is the most beautiful baby ever born, of course. And then your grandbabies are even prettier. Yes, of course. And so, you know, when you have a baby, first, just when you look at that child, you, you see every hair on their head, every every little, their fingernails, every little thing was planned by God. And so you, you understand that in a deeper way. But then as they grow, you really understand that these kids are originals. They are not like anybody else. You cannot, there is not a handbook that you can read that can say at, you know, 27 days, they will sleep through the night. And this will, you know, all these things will happen. They're all different. And they all just come out with different personalities. And you can tell it from just from birth. You can tell their little personalities. I remember um, my sister-in-law, Missy, had a son, Reed, just right before John Luke. And I remember noticing how his hands were different than John Luke. And just thinking, like, oh, I can even tell my baby about their hands. Like, every little thing is unique and original in our children. And so we understand more about how God created us a unique and individual and original. So when Sadie was um, a little girl, she was she really wanted a nickname. She was... In the Robertson family, they give a lot of nicknames, and I really think it's because they just don't know people's names. That's really <laughs> That's the truth, right. especially for Phil. Phil probably does, cannot name all his grandchildren. No. He probably can't. So they, you know, the men in the family give everyone a nickname. They love to have, give nicknames. And like, for instance, if you came to my father-in-law's house and you said your name, he would probably say, call you Virginia. Because you're from Virginia. So that, that's, that's what it is. Like, it does not matter what you tell him your name is. He'll just pick out a name, and that will be your name forever. And so um, so Sadie was, like, five years old, and she just wanted a nickname. She thought that was so special that everyone had a nickname, but she didn't have one. So she actually went to Willie, and she said, Dad, I, I really want a nickname. Can you give me a nickname? And he said, you're just the original. And he put that name on her at five years old, and she took it, and she ran with it. She loved it. And um, now she has a whole ministry called Live Original. Her first book was called Live Original, and is based on that. And, and he, you know, he said, he's like, you're, there's no one else like you. You know, there's not, there's not another name that I can give you, but you're the original. And, um, and we could just see those little things in our kids. Whenever, um, so whenever each of our kids get married, uh, which we've had a lot of weddings. We've had a lot of weddings and a lot of babies in the last few years. I pulled out my journal. And um, whenever they were little, I'm not a big journal writer at all, but when they were little, I made sure to write down just little fun things, of course, our kids said and neat things about them. And whenever I pulled it back out, it was just this reminder of like, oh, God made you exactly who you are today. And I even had this thought, I was like, did I do anything? Like, I felt like I really just fed you because God made you who you are. He created you uniquely and original exactly who you are. And so I pulled out the journal again tonight before I came here tonight to read you a few things about Sadie because a lot of you may know who Sadie is, our daughter. Um, that um, So she has a ministry called Live Original. And, um, you know, she was my little preacher at five years old. She literally, I have a video of her, and I, it's on YouTube, of her preaching on our coffee table. And she's so cute. She's like saying, I don't care if you're a jail person or policeman. God loves you. <laughs> she, she, she had some really good theology at five. Yeah, she really yeah. did. And she just is preaching, and she does a little cheer, like, let's give it up for God. And then, um, so when she was 16, we pulled that video out for her 16th birthday, and we're watching it. And one of the things she said in that video, she says, I don't care if I get famous someday. I will not just think about myself. I will remember God. And it was this moment for us, we were like, whoa, God had this plan all along, you know, before we could even imagine. We were, I was a children's minister at our church, Willie was working at a summer camp, there was no indication we were going to get famous someday. There was definitely no, nothing that this little five-year-old could have known, but God had put that on our heart from such a young age. And I went back and pulled out some of the journal things, and here's a couple that I just thought were fun, because she did, she talked about God and Jesus and the devil, and sometimes I would be a little bit nervous. I was like, all right, you're asking too many questions about that. But um, so here is one thing she said. She said, I said in the journal, I said, she loves to talk about God and going to heaven and what God likes. Today, she said, God doesn't like it when we trick mommies and tell them we have to go to the bathroom when we really don't. It's like, <laughs> true. Yeah. So that's like, yeah. So then she says, I say, Sadie loves to sing. Her favorite song is, oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. I mean, she was a deep child. This is, yeah. uh, both of these are literally from when she was three. This is yeah. three. 
Um, she loves to sing. I said, one day she said, Mom, who is a sinner? I told her everyone sins. She said, I know someone who's not a sinner. I said, who? She said, God. I was like, you're right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And she's three years old, so you can just see how God, and I can do that for each of my children. Each of my kids, I can pull out things that they said and they did at three years old, but now they're 23, and I see God's hand in every single aspect of it. So, you know, I wanted to just tell you tonight that God made each of you as, as originals. That there's not to be compared with anyone else. There's no one else on earth that's ever been made or ever will be made that's like you. And um, so I just want hope that we all can like rest in that. We see that in our children. So I hope that we can understand that about ourselves as well. I love that. And um, I when I think about my three children, how different, and those of you who have more than one, you know that they're all different. And I can remember one time they came to me about something that wasn't fair. And my only answer was, well, guess what? God wasn't fair when he gave me three totally different people. So <laughs> this is what's happening today. So, you know, so. You know, sometimes we just have to capitalize on that thing a little bit, too. Mom was that mom. She actually put us in, in jail one time because we were fighting. And she told us if we get when we get older, you know, if we fight, we don't get along with it, we won't end up in jail. And she said it's only bread and water the whole day. So that's, that's yes. a parenting tip for you young moms. There you go. But look. Look at this. See? Okay. I also, I also was so insistent on manners, and I would tell my children, one day you may eat at the White House. I'm like, Mom, are you crazy? <laughs> okay, there you have it. See, moms? Okay, another thing that God has taught me so much, or what parenting has taught me so much about God in my life, is how he leads and protects me. I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and the other day I was on Sadie's podcast and she was asking me about, um, so I don't know why she was asking this on the podcast, about TV. And I said, yes, we had one TV. We had six children. My grandmother always lived with us and she loved her daytime shows. So there were nine people in the house and there was one TV. And Sadie said, how did you know what to watch at night? I mean, who decided that? And I said, well, that was so easy in the 50s and 60s because your parents were in charge of that. No, no, that was not even a discussion. They were in charge. Now, they considered the wishes of the children, but if they chose something else, the children could leave the room and go to your own room and find something to do or go busy yourself some other place. But I thought about it, and I was telling Sadie, what a confidence we had in life because we knew who was in charge of us. Our parents were in charge of us. At night, I can remember my daddy walking down the hall, peeking in on the girls' room, because you know, we just had the girls' room and the three boys in the boys' room and one bathroom. And he would peek in to make sure we were all snugly tucked into bed. He would turn off the lights, he would lock the door, and I would sleep soundly because Daddy was in charge of me. And that's what we get from having a Heavenly Father. Now, my challenge today, well, let me go back and say this. One thing about my Daddy, as I got older, I learned that my Daddy's Daddy was a drunk. And my grandmother eventually left him and she raised seven children alone. So my daddy didn't learn to be a good daddy from his daddy. My daddy learned to be a good daddy when he turned his life over to the Lord and watched how his heavenly father was a parent to him. And then he became a good daddy and a good protector and a good leader for our family. So as I thought about all of that, for me, as I got older and became a mom, and I'm, I don't know, it's the Southern thing. I was married at 18, and Corey was married at 18, and became a young mom. But I knew that I wanted to lead my family with the same confidence that my mom and dad did. I knew instinctively that their security, their comfort, their peace depended on me being in charge of them and protecting them and leading them and not being afraid to do that. We are living in troubled times, you guys. It's troubling. 
I don't have a teenager right now with Instagram and TikTok talk and Snapchat and all of that, but I have a ton of teenagers with them. So if you are a parent today, it is so important that you take that lead from God because God gave us this role. God is a God of order and he put us in charge of our children so that we can guide them, protect them, lead them, love them, take care of them. And then I think back, I think about, because that's what he does for me. I read the Bible and it is uh, alive. It's breathing and alive. And I'll read something, I'm like, how have I missed that? Like I said with Christy's thing, how have I missed that all my life? Because God is gonna always lead us and guide us where we need to be as same as we are with our children. So watching myself lead my children, guide them, protect them, comfort them, it's like, thank you, God, that you're covering all of us. We've talked many times this weekend about a verse that I love about God going before us and taking care of things for us before we step into it. When John Luke was in the third grade, John Luke's Corey's oldest, my first grandson. So he was brilliant. Can I just say brilliant? So I was with him. We were going to the grocery store. And um, he said, to mama, I learned three things in life. And he was eight. Of course, I'm really excited about knowing those three things. I said, that is awesome, babe. What have you learned? And he said, I've learned you've got to work hard. You've got to play hard. And you've got to expect the unexpected. I told you he's brilliant. <laughs> I said, John Lou, that is so cool. I'm so proud of you. And he said, you know what's the hardest? I said, what is that, babe? He said, expecting the unexpected. I thought, wow, that is so true. And I've thought about that since he was in third. He's probably hadn't thought about it another day. But I've thought about that because that's so true. We can't expect, we can't expect what we don't expect. That it, it's, it doesn't work. So what we have to do is stay prepared in the Lord for whatever might come our way. And how we be prepared in the Lord is to we listen for his leading and his guidance and his comfort. So when something comes up that we couldn't possibly expect, a child gets a divorce, an illness, your husband passes away, you lose your job. We live in a time of, of unpredictable everything. But that's always been the time. It's always, since the beginning of time. You can't predict things. We can't expect what we don't expect. But I think you kind of go back to what John Luke was saying. You work hard. And when I say, when he said play hard, I say pray hard. And then you can handle the unexpected when it comes your way. So the next thing we, um, we thought about that we learned about God as being a mom is that God's love is never ending. We know that about our children that, like, sometimes we might not like them. There's times that you're just like, all right, get out of the room. But, uh, but we will never, ever, ever stop loving them. And I think that that's such a beautiful thing to, to envision God in that. I remember the, remember the book, I'll Love You Forever, I'll Like You For Always, As Long As I'm Living, My Baby, You'll Be. I can hardly even say right. those lines without crying. Yeah. Because I remember at night reading those to our children. I actually would sing that little thing, but I'm not going to sing to you because um, our son, Will, who, um, <laughs> that we adopted, and he has an amazing voice. It did not come from me at all. About yeah. five, he was like, Mom, you're on the right note, but your voice just isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate yeah. that. So I'm not going to sing that to you, but I just remember reading that book. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby will be. And the story goes is she, she's rocking her baby to sleep. And then she sneaks over to her, her you know, son who's now a grown man's house and peeks in his window. And then it ends with him coming back and, and holding her and seeing that over her as his mom. And it's just such a beautiful story, such a beautiful picture of the way we love our children and the way God loves us. And um, so thinking about that, and I'm thinking about how God's love for us, it's so beautiful and amazing because he, he did it. He created us even knowing the risk, you know, knowing that we might hurt him, that we might go another way, that, you know, we have our children knowing that they might throw the temper tantrum, 
in, you know, Target and embarrass us, <laughs> knowing that they might say the cuss word at church that obviously they heard from a movie, clearly. <laughs> that would be the only place they would hear that, you know. So they might do something where that embarrasses us, and they might run away, and they might leave us someday, and they might really do things that hurt us. And God did that same to us. He knew that Adam and Eve, that his first children, were going to just choose Choose what the what the evil one had for them, rather than the glory of his garden that he had for them. He knows that we're going to choose wrong. We're going to turn away from him. But he's such a loving father. He never stops loving us. He will never stop pursuing us. There's um, Luke chapter 15. I love that chapter. It's um, the parables. It's three parables, and it starts out that says Jesus was talking to the tax collectors and the sinners. And I love it so much because it starts with that. It lets us know that Jesus was talking to people that were the unlovable, the people that no one else liked, that were considered the sinners, and he starts it that way. And then it goes on to talk about three parables, and there's three that talk about. The first one is the parable of the lost coin, and it's the story of this woman that has this coin that was worth a lot of money. It was very valuable to her, and she lost it, and she searched and searched. She wouldn't stop searching her home, searching until she find it, because it was something of great value. And so that tells us that our God thinks that we are of great value, and he will never stop searching for us. And then the second one is the parable of the lost sheep. And it's this good shepherd who loves his sheep, and one of the sheep goes astray. And never mind that he had 99 more. That didn't matter. He was not going to let the one go astray. He would search and go find and then carry that sheep back into the fold. And um. So our youngest son, Rowdy, we adopted when he was 12 and came to us and had, had a hard story. And you can imagine he was the only child, um, had been raised by a single father um, that passed away. And he comes into our family as the youngest of six, which had to have been so overwhelming. And I can't even imagine what that might feel like. And so um, he comes into our family, and um, it, was, it was difficult. And, there, and it's honestly still is. There's hard things about his story. but. Um, but I remember the first year we had him, we actually, Sadie did her first tour, her first little original tour. And so we all piled up on buses. Mom and Dad rented an RV and followed us. And we all went around the country for Sadie's little original tour. And Rowdy had just come into our family. I mean, how overwhelming must that have been? And um, I remember one day we were in New Orleans. And Sadie had an event that night. And her speaking was that night in New Orleans. And we were walking down Jackson Square. And Jackson Square, if you've ever been to New Orleans, is busy. There's, like, people doing dances on the streets. There's people dressed up like statues. There's so much happening in Jackson Square. And we were popping in and out of shops, and we had a big group. It was all the kids, and we were all walking around and everything. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and Rowdy's not with us. I'm like, oh, no. So I go back. It's like, everybody stay here. Let me go find Rowdy. So I go back, I retrace my steps, we, we, I found him back in a little little shop that we had been in a little while ways back. And I'm like, oh, Rowdy, hey, you know, I don't even know how long he realized he had been missing, but he knew, he realized that we had left him. And so I was like, Rowdy, come on, come with us, you know, everybody's here, we're, we're right here, you're fine, you know. And um, so I got him and I bring him back, and Will, um, our next oldest son, I guess, who's only 13 months older than Rowdy, we had three middle schoolers at one time. I'm not sure what we were thinking. Um, Will, Will's 13 months older than Rowdy and 10 months older, older than Bella. So it was a little crazy time. People were getting left a lot. But anyway, <laughs> but Rowdy was the one that we didn't need to leave because he was not secure. And his, he didn't have an earthly father that gave him that security. He didn't have a mother that he knew that he could count on. And so it's so important. And so I remember I, I bring Rowdy back and Will, like the typical big brother goes, Oh, dude, you got left. Or no, he said, oh, dude, you got lost. And Rowdy goes, I didn't get lost. I got left. Just like that. And it just broke my heart to think, okay, this little boy thinks that he got left. You know, someone who just has never understood what it means to never get left. So it was a time when I had to say, like, no, like, we came back to find you. Like, I would, I'm never going to leave you. I'll come back and find you no matter where you are. And so, you know, I hope that I can surround him and make him feel that way, but I hope even more so that his Heavenly Father makes him feel that way, that he knows that he will never be left by his Heavenly Father. 
I love that story, Corey. And Rowdy is now um, 19, mm -hmm. and I think that he knows he's not going to be left, you know, by our family. And um, like Corey said, there's a lot of hardness still, a lot of hard times with that. But she, she and Willie have done an amazing job with um, raising him. The last parable that is told about is the parable of the prodigal son. That's what we say it in America. We say the parable of the prodigal son. But in the Middle Eastern culture, they say the parable of the running father. Because remember, they look at it to see how can this teach me about God. And to me, that, again, that was another one of those lightning bolt moments. That is so true because that's really what the scriptures are all about from the beginning of time and i tell young moms all the time if you're discouraged about something you're doing as a parent that your kids aren't minding you guess who had the best parents ever adam and eve and they still didn't do everything right so you're doing fine you're doing great but ever since that beginning of time we've been trying to get back to god and god is just running for us and even in this culture, it would not have been honorable for a daddy in this parable to run, but he ran because his son was coming back to him, and that's how God does us. And that's how we do our children. We learn that our children can't do anything that we're not going to love them. And like Corey said, we may not like them all the time, but we're always going to love them. So raising our children teaches us how God is to us. So we just have to stop long enough in our busyness of being a mom to let that sink into our brains too. Like, oh, wow, I just checked on that baby and patted her on the back, put her pacifier back on her mouth, and guess what? God's doing that for me. He's just like looking down and saying, you've got this. You're okay. Get a good night's sleep. Tomorrow's a new day. You can do it. Wake up. Sleep well. We'll start all over tomorrow. God's doing those things for us. We look at our teenagers and they come in and it's too later than it should have been and we're fussing and kind of guiding them and, no, you've got to pay attention to me. I know what's better for you. And God's like doing the same thing. Like, oh, I, I know that's not really where you need to be. You need to, you know, think about where you are, Mom, what you're doing, how you're leading your kids. God's there to help correct us and guide us. All those things that we do with our children, He's there doing that for us. So we have Mother's Day coming up on Sunday, and I know that, you know, Mother's Day can be a beautiful day, but it can also be a hard day. The relationship with your earthly mother is not what you would hope it would be, or if your earthly mother has passed on, but I just hope, I hope that you're, honored in the way that you, you need to be that day, but even more than that, I hope you understand your relationship with the Father, and I just hope you understand how much He sees you, He watches over you, He delights in you. I hope you see how much He created you as an individual. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. I love that verse where it talks about how God knitted us together in our mother's womb. He's known us before we were ever even created. Um, I hope you remember how he protects you. He watches over you. He leads us and guides us. And most importantly, I hope you know that his love for you will never fail. That's it. But I have to say a little pop, pop culture reference. I probably shouldn't admit this, but I, I watch, I'm on Instagram and do reels. And I broke my toe doing a TikTok at Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's craziness, but... Uh, one of the funniest things I love right now is it's, it's one of those things that you can put, you know, um, your own pictures to. And, and you guys, some of you have seen it. Please tell me that somebody has. I'm not the only one. And, and he, and the, the, the narrator says, oh, have you made people yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I've made people. And I, and I told her, I just love that because I'm like, you know, I look at her and I'm like, I've made people. <laughs> and that's what you guys get to do when you go home at night and look at all your little ones like, oh. Have you made people? Well, I have. <laughs> Look at what I've got here. And actually, that's what God says to all of us. That is what he says, what he challenges the world. Have you made people? Oh, I have. And they're all sitting right here in this room. And they're all here to learn a little bit about me and to grow a little bit closer to, to God. So we have about, whoops, my watch decided Mom's to be crazy. Hitting her activity limit. Oh, 10 minutes. <laughs> that pickleball today put me right over. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've got about 10 minutes, so uh, we thought we would do a little Q&A. And so anything that you've got that you would like to ask us? I was just going to say, we have a reality show about our family, so we our life's an open book. So yeah. you, you can ask anything. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. And, um, and yeah, Lisa said that we're coming back. I think she's prophetic because I don't even know that I've told you that. But we um, we are <laughs> excited because we are making um, a film about Phil and Kay's life right now. We're in the middle of production for that, and that will be out probably next spring. So we're really, really excited about that. And it tells their life story. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people can see someone on television and think, oh, their life was just like this perfect trajectory towards, like, fame and fortune or whatever. But that's never, ever the case. And um, our family life story is has alcoholism and abuse and has, you know, adultery and mental illness. mental illness and lots of difficult things in it. But the grace of God has overcome all of that. And we hope that, um, you know, telling Phil and Kay's story and our family story will show you that. So that'll be out next year. So we're excited about that. And any questions? Okay. Oh my goodness, sweet baby honey. So our great Sadie, um, who we talked about tonight, her little girl's name is Honey. And it's so funny because I feel like people really like think Honey is like their child too. You know, it's so cute. I'll be like, you know, at Hobby Lobby and people are like, oh my honey, you know, I saw she was sick, you know, yep. Which is, is really special. Cause, and that's one of the greatest gifts that we've had, honestly, is through our through doing our show, people will come up and say, I pray for your family. And they, you know, you we know that people really do care for us. And so thank you for asking about her. She is great. She'll be a year on Wednesday. We're having a big party. Sadie said that she has ordered way more things than she could possibly need. Pink ball pits and slides, and it's gonna be fun. And um and so yeah, she'll be one and she's already walking everywhere and she's a brilliant, of course. She uh, <laughs> she is wait, wait, she, I gotta Okay, good. And then she was at my house the other day. She was literally she's not even one yet, doing squats. Like we were laughing so hard at her. She is just the cutest thing. And I meant to include this story because on the part about being a leader, the other day Sadie took her to the doctor because she was kind of unusually fussy and Sadie was just so confident something was wrong with her. So she ran, called us, you know how she calls us and tells us what's happening. She headed to the doctor and then she reported back that the doctor said, she's perfectly fine. It's just time for you to be the parent. She's <laughs> Whoa, uh, a wake up call that, you know, this, this little girl has got a little personality. So Sadie was so funny and so cute about it. Yes, um, Honey definitely has a strong, she, she's dramatic, like her she's mom. Dramatic. Actually, but I always tell the story about whenever Sadie was little, we went to see the movie Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, that, she, we were going in, we went in the movie, I had just gotten all four kids. We had four, like, under the age of, I see five and under at the time. We were all lined up, and then she forgot something in the car. She wanted me to go, me to go back and get it. And I was like, sorry, like, I'm not going back to get it. Like, we're here. We're all sitting down. I'm not loading up all these kids and going back to the car. And she was so mad. So she's sitting in that chair, just pouting, you know, in the, during the movie. And the movie Spirit comes on about this wild horse that they can't tame. And I was like, hmm, that feels a little <laughs> familiar. And then after the movie, say you love the movie so much, she wanted to be named Spirit. So she asked us if we'd call her Spirit. I'm like, she really related to that film. Okay. But, um, but Honey has a lot of, she's she's so much fun. And, um, but yeah, she actually rolls her tongue when she, I've never heard another baby do it. When she gets upset, she, she goes like that, <gasps> rolls her tongue. Yeah. It's so funny. Very it's like dramatic. passionate, like tongue roll. So whenever she gets mad, she starts rolling her tongue and it's hilarious. Okay. We, we laugh. I have to add on to the life lessons here. Uh, I was, of course, with them at Spirit watching, and this is a grandma lesson. I could have easily gone to the car and gotten the blanket that Sadie left, but should grandmas do that when mama has said something else? <laughs> no. So I sat there and watched that baby be upset. <laughs> like a good grandma and stood behind Corey making the right decision to teach her her daughter a little lesson so yes she uh, honey's honey's got the sweetest little cutest little personality and all of our little so babies fun. do it's so fun yeah. so fun to watch them. i think there was another question over here
Yeah. 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 We have definitely been there. We totally understand that. And it is not easy. And, you know, it is another reminder of the heart of God is how, you know, we just have to keep being there and being present and being there and being like, I'm, I'm not leaving. Like, you're, I'm here for you. And, you know, for us, you know, we, we celebrate the little wins, the times when I'll text him that morning and say, hey, we're going to be at 11 o'clock service. Hope to see you there. And we walk in and he's there. We're like, whoa, this is amazing, you know, to celebrate the little wins when they come. And, um, and you know, try to just be there. That's what we try to do. Definitely. We've seen God answer big prayers this year. Um, he's got a job now and he's doing really well and his bosses loves him and he loves her and so I'm so thankful for that. But um six months ago I would have not believed that was that was gonna be in our cards for the next six months. And six so months down the road it may not be. You right. know, we don't so know. Prayers and I think yeah. just being present and being that stability for whenever they do come back to you and then celebrate the even the, the little bitty wins, you know. So I hope that helps. Yeah. And can I can I add to that that it doesn't have to be an adopted child struggling like that because that can be anybody's child and the answer is always the same. You just love them through the mess they're in and keep supporting and keep praying and always say that just because someone doesn't want to do the things you do, if the things you do are right, you keep doing them. And you just keep showing and you keep showing up and keep being the right example. And so it's adopted children, yes, present other problems, but our other kids can too. And so we just have to keep showing up for them like, like God does for us. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Is there another one over here? We get everybody in this corner. Anybody else? Yeah, so um, we haven't done it all perfectly. There's not like a handbook out there for it. But, um, you know, we really try to, you know, there there have been times when kind of fear has crept into it. We're like, okay, is this why should we, should we do this? Should we put this out there? Because there are crazy people in the world, for sure. And we've experienced our fair share of them, for sure. Um, but, you know, there was a time when Sadie, when Sadie was going to go and answer the stars. And she was 16 years old. And she said, Mom, can I go to answer the stars? stars and I remember I, I said go ask your dad because I was like oh, I'm not sure about that you're 16 years old and we had a show we had that dynasty but there was a safety in kind of like our family unit we're still in West Monroe in our little town and we were all kind of doing this together so there was a safety in that and I remember you know being a little fearful about that I was like oh is this the right thing and um and there was this moment just before she they had offered her to come and then she had fear she was like Oh, I don't think I want to do it. You know, I don't know. I don't want to do it. I don't know about this. And we, um, and so we had this night where we just stayed up till like four in the morning and we prayed and we, we paused and we prayed and we paused and we prayed. And I knew this was something that she had really wanted to do. I knew that this was fear creeping in, and I was feeling it too as a mom. So we woke up the next morning. We didn't have a resolution about it, and um, I'll never forget. I would call mom, and she said, "You know, I've talked to my friend Jenny. Now, mom's friend Jenny is a prayer warrior." She's a strong woman of faith, and she said, Jenny said, you tell Corey not to be scared. She said, Sadie has a spirit of God in her, and there is no devil that can come against that. And it was just this confidence of like, oh, she's got the spirit. We've got the spirit in God, in God in us. Like, we should be walking strong and walking tall and not be fearful. We should be the most confident and brave people in the world because we have the spirit of God in us. And the same time that conversation was happening, Sadie was in the car with our daughter, Bella, and he was like nine at the time, I think. Or she was 12. She was 12. He was 12 at the time. And she was like, I don't think I want to do it. I just don't know. And Bella, who's 12, said, is this Sadie talking or is this fear talking? And, like, called Sadie out right then. So Sadie called me and was like, Mom, Bella just said this. And I'm like, well, 
See, Mama just said this. So I think we have our answer after all this prayer. So, you know, I think that this world is scary. And we definitely, with our children, oh, my goodness, we have to take safety precautions and we have to watch. But also, we have to know that, like, our children have the Spirit of God in them. They need to be lights in the world. We can't live in the Spirit of God. We can't hide under the bushel. And so that's just how we've chosen to live our lives. And any time that, that fear has crept in, we're like, nope. You know, we got the Spirit of God in us. We are going to go out with, with confidence and, and be the lights in the world that we know God has called us to be. One of the things that Corey said through the ki- to the kids all through D- Dynasty, she said it more than once, and you need to speak things over your kids more than once because they don't get it the first time. You know, you got to just keep speaking it. And Corey would say, don't believe everything they say about you on social media. That's good, and don't believe everything that's bad. Our lives are somewhere in the middle. And I thought that was such good thinking for her to just like, Look, they're going to say a lot of great things about you. Say that you're awesome, you're the light, you're the star of this, you know. Well, that can be just as bad for you mentally as the bad things. If you take all that to where then you're just, you know, own the world, you know, and then all the bad things. And certainly we've had our share of bad things said about the kids on social media. And uh, I think because Corey and Willie and the whole family handled it together with this idea of, you know, it, we don't know those people. It doesn't matter what they're saying. And, just, and, and of course, you know, you can say that to your teenagers and sometimes that doesn't hit them. But if there's strength in numbers, you know, get their friends and all of you and talk about it and share and communicate and keep the channels open to those kinds of things because there's crazy people in the world, but we aren't defined by crazy. We're defined by God. And so we just keep on, keep on doing it. All right, one more. One more. We have one more. All right, in the back. Okay. Okay. Oh, and it, oh, and God God wins. Wins. oh my goodness. Okay, that is yes. great, great ending question. Yes. Uncle Sai is doing amazing. Great. He so he actually had COVID and was really sick. I mean, he he got it bad, and he actually he he'll he'll tell you like he had a point where he was like. He didn't want it. He couldn't get out of bed. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to do anything. And the guys in our family, it was so sweet to see. The guys in our family just were like, nope, we're not letting you go. We're not letting you die. So they made Sai eat. They made him take his medicine. They took over this little bike thing that he had to, you know, to make him just move his legs. And he did that. And he had to be on oxygen for quite a while after that. And we were like, oh, is Sai ever going to kind of recover? Sai spoke, smoked for like, I don't know how many, 50 years probably. And so he has, you know, does not, his lungs are not good. He has the OPD and we just thought, oh, is he ever going to come back? But let me tell you, that man has a new lease on life and is crazier than ever. Yeah. He's off his oxygen. <laughs> he is having fun and he is even exercising and it's so fun to see. So well, they have a podcast called The Duck Call Room that I don't know if y'all heard, but where the guys in the Duck Call Room just talk. And it's so much fun, and Sa is hilarious and crazier than ever. And he just turned 74, um, and they had the big poker tournament blowout party for him, yes. what, Saturday night or Sunday Saturday, night? Yeah. Sunday, Sunday night. Sunday night. Yeah. 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 So I was the only girl who played in the poker tournament, yeah. so I was proud of that. And I made it, I made it quite a while, but, um, but and Sa, so we let Sa buy in as many times as a tournament, so you can only buy in a certain amount of time, but we said Sa could buy in as much as he wanted to. So I think he might have won, but that was because I also put the most money in for sure. <laughs> but everyone was buying, you know, everyone's buying in for him. Oh, so I'll buy you back in. So, um, but it, it was a fun night. And, and John Godwin is doing awesome. Right. He's on Duck Call Ring as well. Yeah. He and his wife Paula are amazing. Willie just turned 50 as well. So we had a big party for him last Saturday, or last Sunday. And um, we had a rose um, for Willie. And everyone just got off their chest everything they about Willie. So it, was, it was so much fun. We laughed like all night long, but everyone was there and it was, it was really fun to have everybody at our house for that. All right. I think that's it. We good? Tom? We good? All right. I'm live. Thank you all so much for having us, for making us buy a dress and put on real shoes yeah. and get out in public. Thank you so much.